Our scripture passage tonight, Lamentations 5, at verse number 19. I'll explain a little bit more of the context as we go through, but just for the sake of uh, shortness, we'll look at just that one verse, number 19. The prophet cried out in his lament for the exile, the destruction of Jerusalem and its temple. And he said in prayer, but you, O Lord, reign forever. Why do you forsake us for so many days? Let's pray. Our gracious and our great heavenly father, you have given us your word to be a light for our path and a lamp for our feet. And we pray now that you would uh, sustain our souls and refresh our hearts, fill our minds with your truth, and Lord, uh, elicit from our lips your praise, the praise that is, uh, that is deserving to you and that you also desire from us. Hear us, we pray. Help us to understand. Help us to apply your words. We pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people say, Amen. Well, tonight we want to continue uh, a brief series of sermons on the doctrine of God. Uh, his attributes, uh, who God is, what he's like, uh, why you and I should trust in him. And uh, tonight I want us to think about the eternity or the eternality of God. And here the prophet gives a sense of that or a hint of that uh, when he speaks of the Lord reigning forever. And then you see that next line, your throne endures to all generations. I'll come to, the, to explain that in just a second here. Uh, but let's think of this passage here and, and uh, in its context. Uh, it, if, if you would read the whole chapter, beginning at verse number one, uh, it would maybe kind of elicit the, uh, the thought of this. Well, have you ever had one of those kind of days? Uh, maybe you tossed and turned all night. That was probably most of us last night who, whose air conditioning doesn't work uh, like ours or you don't have an AC. Uh, there was not very much breeze last night here in sunny Southern California, right? The, the beach. Uh, the, the joys of, uh, of, of Oceanside and Carlsbad. Uh, but here, here, uh, there we were last night tossing and turning. Uh, and maybe as you just started to fall asleep, your alarm went off. You went to brush your teeth and the toothpaste dispenser was completely empty. You went to comb your hair. No matter how much hairspray or gel you used, you still had a pillow head. That was me this morning. Uh, this, this humidity is not good for uh, Pastor Danny's spike, okay? So I have to go get some new gel this afternoon over at CVS. <laughs> you, pulled your, you poured yourself a bowl of cereal. Uh, you only got about, a, about three spoonfuls of, uh, spoon, spoonfuls of milk uh, that came out of the carton. On the way to work, you noticed that you had almost no gas. So you had to get off the freeway, fill up, only to be late to work. When you went to get money from the bank, uh, at its ATM machine, well, it was down for repairs. Have you ever had one of those kind of days? If you read Lamentations 5, I encourage you to do that this, uh, this evening, your problems begin to come into perspective. Talk about spiritual warfare, right? I mean, we, we have a bad day, bad hair day. Uh, it's hot for a couple of days, and it's tough for us. Uh, but if you read Lamentations 5, right, it's real suffering. And multiply this many times over, and you begin to move close to the situation of the people of God here in Lamentations 5. The Babylonians have, had just taken captive Judah, that southern kingdom, that, that remnant of God's grace, taken them captive in 586 B.C., and they stayed there in Babylon until 538, about 50 years. They were in exile until the Persians released them. And you begin to see the agony of the people of God because of their sin. Notice in verse 2. So we'll kind of quickly go through that chapter. Notice in verse 2 here, the prophets lamenting on behalf of the people of God because the Israelites, the Judahites, have been taken captive by the Babylonians, just as God had said. And in verse 2, our inheritance has been turned over to strangers. The land of, that was flowing with milk and honey had become a land of desolation because of the Judahites' sin. Verse 3 says they had lost their parents and they had become like orphans. Their mothers had become widows. Verses 4 and 5 says, it says, it says that they were working unto exhaustion just to buy water and wood to cook with for that one night. 
Verse 9 says that it was dangerous to even go out and harvest grain because all the enemies, the Babylonians, had swords in their hands just waiting to pounce. They were sick with fever, verse 10. Their women were raped, verse 11. Their elders were disrespected, verse 12. And uh, as as it continues to go on, it speaks uh, of their boys becoming slave labor in verse 13. The elders no longer gathered, nor boys played music, verse 14. And so Jeremiah concluded in verse 15, the joy of our hearts has ceased. So we might have one of those days, but here the prophet speaks of real suffering, real tragedy, uh, real struggle. What got them through that? Again, read chapter 5 this evening. What got them through that? What calmed their fears? What assured them of ultimate justice? And blessing. What got them through, you think? The Lord, right? It's the good Sunday school answer, kids. God. God is the one who got them through all their struggles. The nature of God is what got them through. They remember, the prophet, he remembers who God is. What God is like. And knowing who God is and what he's like, we call that theology, gets us through struggles. In contrast to all the struggles before, verse number 19 again says, But you, O Lord, reign forever. Your throne endures to all generations. That's what got them through. Their total reliance upon God. Now, you and I, you and I may have lost that. We may have lost that today in our time. Total reliance upon God. Uh, we, we are reliant upon the politicians. We're reliant upon Uh, The Fed giving us a break on our interest rates, right? We are reliant upon our 401ks, our 403bs, our retirement accounts, what rate CDs get. We are reliant on everything else but God. A.W. Tozer once wrote in his little book, The Knowledge of the Holy, I think it's mentioned there in the sermon notes page, says this, the church has surrendered her once lofty concept of God and substituted for it one so low, so so ignoble, as to be utterly unworthy of thinking, worshiping men. Do we trust God? Do we trust this God? O Lord, you reign forever. Your throne endures to all generations. And so tonight I want us to again think about God. Recapture a vision of who God is so that you and I can rely on him in times of need. And our text instructs us that the contemplation and meditation upon our eternal God will do much for us in terms of building our faith, assuring you and me in times of deep doubts, giving us an eternal perspective in the midst of a very unforgiving world that we live in. And as we seek to know who God is and what are his attributes, what he's like, how that benefits us, we'll know God even more. Again, Tozer said, without doubt, the mightiest thought the mind can entertain is the thought of God. And the weightiest word in any language is its word for God. So, let's think of our passage tonight. I want you to just notice with me quickly. What does it mean to say that God is eternal? God is eternal. Our forefathers were in a time of total weakness as spiritually languishing pilgrims in exile. And their hope was in a God who reigns forever and whose throne endures to all generations. Again. Now, so, so, so negatively... What does God's eternity not mean? Negatively, God's eternity means that he's not limited uh, by temporal limits. He's not limited. So sort of a negative definition. He's not limited by temporal limits. There are no time constraints with God. He had no beginning. He has no duration of time. He will have no end. So God is not limited by time constraints. Positively, the eternity of God means that he exists in one indivisible, eternal present. God is a simple God. He is a spiritual God. And he exists. He is. He is. He told that to to Father Moses in the wilderness, at the burning bush, that he is who he is. One hymn says it like this. Thou hadst no youth, great God, and unbeginning end thou art. Thy glory in itself abode and still abides in its own tranquil heart. No age can heap its outward years on thee, dear God. 
thou art thyself, <clears throat> thine own eternity. God reveals himself in scripture then, speaking to us in our own popular language <clears throat> that we can grasp. It speaks of eternity here in terms of God having endless duration. The Lord reigns forever. His throne endures to all generations. We read elsewhere <clears throat> that he lives forever. The prophet Daniel said he lives forever. Uh, the, the psalmist, Moses, in Psalm number 90, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. He lives forever. He had no beginning. He exists. He existed. Behold, God is great, Job says. The number of his years is unsearchable. So if we were to conceive of God in terms of years and length of time, unsearchable, Job says. Now, that, that's a human way of describing a God who is beyond our thoughts and beyond our ways, who's not like us, who's different than us. He's God. So it means that he's God. That's why the most lofty word in our language is God. The word would be used for, for him. He is different than us. Uh, he is simple. He is spiritual. He is eternal. But yet we speak of him with this language of unending years. He has no beginning. Uh, he has no and the psalmist says this, while the heavens and earth will wear out like a garment and be changed like a robe, will pass away. He says of God, you are the same. Your years have no ends. Here's what God says in Revelation. I am the Alpha and the Omega. Those are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. So the A to Z for us. Who is, who was, who is to come. God exists. He has always existed, and he always will exist. God is eternal. He's the first, the last. He's the beginning. He's the end. And so, here's the lament of Jeremiah. But you, O Lord, reign forever. They, they are living in a situation in which they are being reigned over by their enemies, by God's enemies. But God reigns forever. Your throne endures to all generations. Now it's important as we, as we think about that, we read those kinds of verses in the Bible, not to think of eternity merely as a timeline, okay? Uh, with arrows pointed in opposite directions. Maybe that's how we conceive. Imagine a timeline on a piece of paper, right? There's successions of times. Now, just now, write it also. Write write a line above that line. So we make a little timeline, and just above that right line, write another line uh, with a beginning point and an end point. Right? That's time. Time is uh, a beginning and an end. It's a finite thing. It has a limit. God's eternal. Time dwells within eternity. Right? God has no beginning. He has no end. He is. He is. Thomas Watson once wrote that. As the earth is but a small point to the heaven, so time is but, nay, scarce a minute to eternity. So if we had to think of, 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 of eternity in terms of time, it, it would be just a minute of it would be an eternal in the presence of God. This is why we can say God's not bounded by time, but he enters into our time, right? Because time is finite. God is not. And so God can enter into that finite universe. While the animal kingdoms had a beginning and will have an end, while angels and our souls had a beginning and will also, but, but, but will also, but, but will have no end, God had no beginning. He will have no end. He is. God's the eternal presence. God's the Alpha and Omega right now. God is the beginning and the end right now. He's the first and the last right now. He is. God is. But you, O oh Lord, reign forever. Your throne endures to all generations. So how does this help us? How does it benefit us to know that God is eternal? He made time. Uh, he, he's a, he exists outside of time. He exists in time. Yet he's not bounded by time. How does that help you and I as believers? Well, first of all, there's a couple of things just to say in terms of how it benefits and helps us. When we think about God being eternal, how does that benefit our souls? First, because God is eternal, he reigns in our suffering. That's what Lamentations is telling us. 
Because God is eternal. He reigns in the midst of our sufferings. He's lamenting here. He's crying out. He's weeping because of this peril that's overwhelmed him and the Israelites. No, but Judah, what, what Lamentations 5 verse 16 says, if you have your Bible still open, the crown has fallen from our head. Woe to us, for we have sinned. Judah no longer had royalty, no longer was the royal city because the kingship, the temple was destroyed and the Babylonians completed their work. And so it's as if the crown has fallen off the head of Judah. Why? Because we have sinned. The king of Babylon overtook the Lord's anointed, or at least it looked that way. But God was teaching them a lesson in this. He was their true king all along, not the sons, the generations after David. But you, O Lord, not David, not Hezekiah, not Josiah, not the good kings of old. No, you, O Lord, reign forever. Your throne endures to all generations. Notice how those, those two lines are in parallel to each other. And they're poetic lines meant to, uh, to uh, emphasize this. Parallel to the Lord is throne in that parallelism. And forever is paralleled with all, uh, endures to all generations. Israel cried out and trusted in the Lord as their king who reigns lit olam unto eternity. What are you struggling with? What attacks are you suffering from the world, the flesh, the devil tonight? Don't be filled with despair though, because Jesus Christ is your eternal king. And he reigns in all your trials. He's still the Lord, isn't he? Still the Lord. How does it help us? Secondly, because God is eternal. He's worthy of our worship. Because he's eternal. He's worthy of our worship. I'll just mention Psalm 29. If you, you can turn there, but I'll just mention here a couple of verses. Uh, three times in Psalm 29 at the beginning, we are called to ascribe to the Lord glory do his name Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. And then we go on to read uh, uh, of the power of his voice seven times. Seven is that number of perfection in the Old Testament. Seven times in verses uh, three through nine, we, we, we read about the power of God, his voice being powerful. Why is he so worthy of our glory, our giving him glory? Why is he so powerful? Verse 10 of Psalm 29, the Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. Just like our lamentation is speaking of. So he's worthy of our worship because he's king. He's worthy of our worship because he will reign over hardship forever. He's worthy. And so ascribe to him the glory due his name. We read from Job 1 tonight. The Lord gives, the Lord takes. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Can you say that tonight? Can you say that? Third, because God is eternal, he comforts us by caring for us. Think about that. The eternal God who, who, who is, who's created time. It's a construct of his creation. He exists outside of it. He's not bound by it, yet he exists within it. He cares for you. He cares for you. Again, I'll just mention another passage. Isaiah chapter 40. Well, we, we know the, the familiar part of that uh, passage as it opens up comfort comfort my people says your God speak tenderly to Jerusalem but why was Israel to be comforted because their God is not only mighty as the prophet goes on to say but because he is eternal because he's eternal they should be comforted they were crying out my way is hidden from the Lord my right is regarded by my God uh, my right is disregarded, excuse me, by my God. That's how we feel when we feel like God is distant from, uh, from us. Our ways are hidden from Him. Uh, our, uh, our right is disregarded by Him. He's forgotten us. What's the remedy? Isaiah says this, Isaiah 40, verse 28. Have you not known, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. Notice that the comfort comes in the context here of this everlasting God. Their trials and their tribulations had a finite beginning and a middle and an end, but God doesn't. And so we read there in Isaiah 40, God, speaking of God, he does not faint or grow weary. 
but gives power to the faint. And to him who has no might, he increases strength. Finally, because God is eternal, he assures us of our eternal salvation. The eternal God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ in the heavenly places, chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. And he also gives us his Holy Spirit as the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. This eternal God, for who from all of eternity past, if we can speak that way, and into eternity future, guarantees our salvation. He chose us in Christ. And he gives us the spirit as a down payment for that final day of redemption. And so knowing this, knowing that God is the one who's made, who, who's chosen us and God's the one who in Christ redeems us and God in, in the Holy Spirit's power is the one who preserves us unto the end of eternal life. Are you enjoying that eternal life right now? You have right now at this point. Little moment in time, this blip on the radar of human history, you now have eternal life. Are you enjoying that eternal life? Again, Tozer wrote this, that which is the crown of, and zenith of heaven's happiness is that it is the eternal. Eternity makes heaven to be heaven. It is a diamond in the ring. And you already have this. What makes us happy for eternity is to know that we are there with God, the eternal one, forever and ever. And so our passage speaks of a very tragedy, but it also speaks to us about maybe having one of those kinds of days. If you're a human being, you've had that kind of a day. You struggle, you sin, you stumble and fall, you doubt, you worry, you're anxious, you get at, uh, angry, you get sad, you know how it goes. It's an everyday occurrence if you're a human being, isn't it? And if you're a human being, you're gonna have more days like that. Jesus doesn't wipe them all away, he just helps us make sense of them. So you're gonna have more of those kinds of days. But if you're a Christian, if you put your trust in the Lord who, made, who has made the heavens and the earth, you have the plus, the added plus to all your struggles of sin, in the battle between your, uh, within your soul, between the flesh and the spirit, you have all this strength because you have the eternal God who's for you. He's on your side. He is your God. And you are his people. You are his children. You are his child. Let's trust him. Let's give our hearts to him. Let's pour ourselves out before him tonight in our time of prayer. We turn back on the